Okay, so I think we'll make a start. Um, thank you for taking the time to log in this evening and listen to this talk. My name is Shirley Bell and I work at Northern Ireland Veterinary Specialists. So this evening we're going to look at nursing the BOAS patient. Um, and if you have any questions, just use the Q&A button that you should find on your screen. And we'll try and answer as many as we can at the end. So, as I said this evening, we are going to look at the role of the nurse in managing BOAS patients in hospital. So, although we're focusing on patients having BOAS surgery, many of the principles can be transferred across to managing any brachycephalic breed coming into your veterinary surgery for any procedure. And we're going to look at what equipment is useful for these cases and your role in pre-medication induction, recovery, use of nebulizers and tracheostomy tubes. So as you know, I'm sure BOAS stands for Brachycephalic Obstructive Airway Syndrome. And if you've been around veterinary practice for any length of time, you're likely to have come across this disease because the popularity of these breeds is increasing all of the time. The anatomical abnormalities common to this condition are stenotic nares, an elongated soft palate, hyperplastic tonsils, everted saccules, laryngeal collapse, hyperplastic trachea. And they're also prone to many other comorbidities such as corneal protrusion and decreased corneal sensitivity, sliding hiatal hernia and spinal disease. And we need to be aware of managing these alongside the BOAS surgery, but we're not going to address these fully tonight or else we'd be here all night. <clears throat> you can find more information on what we can do to help these patients surgically. If you tune into Aidan McLinden's webinar from last month, but tonight we're just going to focus on the nursing care of the BOAS patient. So if you have one of these cases coming in, then there needs to be communication amongst the team so that everyone is aware of the patient and what the potential complications might be and how they are to be managed and what resources will be needed for the safe management of the patient. So thinking about the equipment that you have and the staff that are available. When is the patient scheduled for the procedure? and the timing of the admit can also have a factor to play. So if the patient is one that gets easily stressed in hospital, then consider pre-medication on admit and scheduling the procedure to go first so that the patient isn't hanging around in kennels, getting stressed and panting and inflaming their airway before the procedure begins. Scheduling the procedure early in the day is also good so you have a longer period of time with most staff around for post GA recovery and observation before a decision needs to be made on whether the patient should spend the night in hospital or go home. The aim of the pre-med is to provide sedation, analgesia, facilitate a smooth induction and recovery from anaesthesia without flattening the patient too much that it compromises their ability to breathe. As we are carrying out surgery, the pre-med used will need to contain a pure opioid such as methadone. Methadone is less likely than morphine to cause vomiting, which is undesirable in these patients as they are also prone to aspiration pneumonia. Consider what other multimodal analgesia techniques can be employed to reduce the overall side effects of a higher dose of your pre med drugs. So, other techniques suitable for BOAS surgery are using continuous rate infusions of drugs like fentanyl, paracetamol, ketamine, or lidocaine. The use of non steroidals is usually avoided in case um, corticosteroids are required in the post operative period. And just find that the more drugs you use, like the multimodal approach, then the less dose you have to give. So the more you give, the less you give, if that sort of makes sense. 
When thinking about the dose of pre-med that you want to use, then you need to consider the weight of the patient and the body condition score of the patient. Brachycephalic dogs are rarely the picture of health, unfortunately. They might regurgitate after meals, leaving them malnourished. Their airway disease may mean that they cannot exercise fully. So when, so they, in comparison to mesocephalic or doliocephalic breeds, are quite unfit and in a poorer state to be undergoing general anaesthesia. Lack of exercise may also mean they're overweight. Unlike in, in humans, if it's possible to delay an elective surgery until the patient has lost weight, then it's more beneficial for them to do so. But in this case, sometimes these patients are presented because of airway complications, so they can't afford to wait. We must take this into consideration. We also want to consider their age. So younger dogs are more sensitive to sedation drugs. They might present really bright and bouncing off the walls, but if you give a full dose of pre-med, then you're going to predispose them to an obstructed airway. They also might get vasodilation, which leads to hypotension and hypothermia. Patients under eight months of old may not fully develop their cardiovascular system, and higher doses of pre-med drugs will cause bradycardia, which will have a direct effect on their blood pressure. Also think about the route of administration. If you've been able to place an IV catheter and use it, and use a reduced dose of the drugs. It's much easier to control the effect and has a quicker time of action. So you're not wasting personnel and observations for ages after an intramuscular pre-med. Brachycephalic breeds are more sensitive to sedation drugs. And I would recommend more conservative doses such as 0.2 mg per kg of methadone or 0 point, and 0.05 mg per kg of ACP or swap your ACP for dexmedetomidine and use a low dose of 0.002 mg per kg. If these doses are not enough, you can top them up. It's easier to top up than take away if you've given too much. Also consider the length of duration of the drugs. So ACP isn't a reversible drug and it can last for up to six hours. So if the patient isn't coping with this, then you're gonna to have to endure six hours of support and hard work helping the patient maintain his or her airway. Alpha-2 drugs have a more potent sedative effect, but are easily controlled, short acting and reversible. Intravenous access is obviously essential to establish in these breeds as soon as they are admitted to the hospital, but it does need to with how stressed the patient is and not needing very aggressive or heavy handed restraint, which could compromise their airway. The use of Ethicam spray or Emla cream can be invaluable in these patients. These are skin numbing sprays and cream. The spray has an immediate effect, but the patient can react to its coldness. The cream takes a good 20 to 30 minutes to take effect. Use your best personnel to hold the patient and place the IV. You sometimes only get one chance, and these aren't the ones to have a student that's seeing practice have a go on. Think about the environment. Use a calm, quiet room with a lock on the door rather than a thoroughfare where there's people bursting through doors and rushing about at the wrong moment. Start calmly talking to the patient and getting them to settle before restraint. Then use gentle restraint to clip the limb over the IV. If this doesn't go well, I would stop there, place Emla cream over the leg and ask the veterinary surgeon if we can pre-med intramuscularly first. Once pre-medded, the patient needs to be placed somewhere quiet and calm to give the drugs a chance to work. If the patient is overstimulated by the environment, you can enter into a cycle of wind-up. You then give more drugs 
and it's more stressful for the patient and you've still no IV access. Higher doses of the pre-med drugs at this point may not increase your sedation, but could increase the severity of the side effects and prolong their duration. Although the patient needs to go somewhere quiet, this isn't the patient to place in a darkened x-ray room and go off and leave unattended. The patient needs to be constantly observed. As we mentioned before, some of these patients have really bad anatomy and that means the slightest sedation can cause them compromise. Once the pre-med has taken effect, then proceed calmly to clean the skin and place the IV catheter. Often bulldog type breeds have thickened skin and when combined with a bit of vasodilation, sometimes the vein when it's raised isn't very obvious or visual. So I would recommend the use of a tourniquet around the elbow, which can really help to raise the vein and give you the best chance of placing a catheter. If restraint around the head is causing a problem, then maybe choose a, a saphenous vein and that might be more com comfortable for the patient. I think nurses in general practice can actually make a really big difference here. If you're able to run puppy parties and catch these patients when they're puppies and get them socialized to the veterinary environment and used to being restrained for IV placement in a fun and non-stressful way, what a positive and possibly life-saving impact you can have on their stress levels in the future rather than having a stressful IV placement. So I would really encourage those of you who run poppy parties to keep doing this. You're doing a great job. Okay, so let's turn our attention to equipment that we have available to us. This equipment needs to be readily available as it might be needed in an emergency. It should be available and stay with the patient from admission or pre-medication through to discharge. If you haven't got one already, I would recommend gathering all the useful equipment that we're going to talk about here for difficult intubations and creating an airway box that can live beside your emergency box or crash trolley. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, just a toolbox or a plastic box, whatever you have. And this will save you valuable time if you have an airway emergency rushed into the clinic or if a cephalic patient suddenly deteriorates in hospital. It should contain stylets and a urinary catheter. These can help guide an endotracheal tube into the trachea when there is a lot of soft tissue in the way. A urinary catheter can also be attached to a breathing system in an emergency to provide oxygen into the lungs, which can buy you time when preparing for an emergency tracheostomy tube placement if an ET tube cannot be placed. If the patient cannot be intubated normally, another technique that might be used is to carry out a needle cricothyroidotomy. So taking a large bore IV catheter and placing it directly into the trachea and attaching it to the same syringe and ET tube connector to an anaesthetic circuit will again buy you time and get oxygen into the lungs whilst you prepare for the next step. So pop some of these large catheters into your emergency airway box. Endotracheal tubes, cuffed and uncuffed, longer small diameter tubes, for when you can only get a really small like four millimeter uncuffed tube into like a French bulldog. Um, if you just had regular cat tubes, these would likely be too short and could easily slip out of the trachea, which you really don't want to happen mid-surgery. Just notice that the ET tubes in this picture are all clear PVC tubes. This is deliberate as the red rubber tubes many of you will be familiar with are not an appropriate part of the airway box. For the main reason that you cannot visualize that they're not holding an obstruction themselves and it's not good practice to blow through them yourself before intubation. Red rubber tubes are not as safe as clear tubes for a number of reasons. They do not have a Murphy's eye. This is the hole in the side of the tube 
at the tip shown by the blue arrow. The purpose of this is if the end of the tube became lodged against the tracheal wall, gas would still be able to flow through the tube and not block the airway. The cuffs in red rubber tubes are low volume, high pressure cuffs, as opposed to high volume, low pressure cuffs on clear tubes. This means when they are inflated, they inflate in a balloon shape rather than a sausage shape. There is a high pressure point where the surface meets the trachea, whereas with the sausage shape, the pressure is spread over a wider surface area and you do not need as much pressure to create a seal. The red, tuber, red rubber cuffs are more difficult to inflate slowly to just create a seal and the cuff end can be difficult to keep inflated. It can easily be knocked open or you need a needle cover to keep it inflated. The clear tubes usually have a one-way valve so they can be inflated to affect much more easily. You can also see in this older pale tube the cuff is inflating unevenly and bulging to one side so that's not so good. Cuff pressure should not exceed the perfusion pressure within the capillary bed of the tracheal mucosa and is recommended to be maintained between 18 to 24 millimetres of mercury to prevent ischemic tracheal injury. Pressures can be checked using a cuff pressure manometer and here on the screen we have two different examples of these. Another safe way of inflating a cuff if you don't have one of these is for one person to give a manual breath and a second person to listen for a leak on expiration and then only inflate the cuff until there is no leak audible. This does not measure cuff pressure accurately but it is safer than blindly injecting 20 mils of air into every ET tube regardless of the size of patient. airway box should definitely contain a selection of suction catheters so you can see in the picture here the finger operated type ones that allow controlled suction of the airway if there's a lot of mucus present or if the patient regurgitates an induction or in the emergency situation where they haven't been starved and they vomit or whatever a percentage of brachycephalic patients also have a sliding hiatal hernia present and this means abdominal contents. Often their stomach slides in and out through their diaphragm and they're prone to regurgitation at all times, but especially when anaesthetized. So intubies, self-explanatory. If this was a cat emergency, then you would still need to use a local anaesthetic to prevent spasm of the larynx. And this takes 30 seconds to work. So be patient and provide oxygen whilst you wait. A laryngoscope with a selection of blades and a working battery and bulb, very important. And these should be checked regularly as part of a monthly checklist of the contents of the airway box. It's really a vital piece of equipment in an emergency and prevents wasted time intubating the esophagus rather than the trachea through visualization of where the tube is being placed. The syringe with a little blue piece of bandage in it, this is what we use as a cuff syringe so again, very important to inflate the tube before lowering the head in case of regurgitation and that will protect the patient's airway. A white open weave or knit firm type of bandage to secure the tube well once intubated because you don't want to have to repeat the process of a difficult intubation because of a loose tube tie. Brachycephalics often have no maxilla to secure the tube to, so the tie needs to be long enough to go around the head of the patient. So having pre-cut long tube tie will save you time. The wooden spatula is used for um, the airway exam. It helps to move soft tissues out of the way, or sometimes a second laryngoscope blade is requested to assist with the intubation. 
swabs and gloves um, help to hold the tongue if it's quite slippery from excess saliva or vomiting. An induction agent, propofol or alvaxalone to hand in the box, also good. The airway box shouldn't be overcomplicated. In an emergency, you won't want to open it and put your hand on what you want without having to look through 20 ET tubes to get the size you want. You might want to group the tubes together into sizes like this to help with tube selection in an emergency. And also any of you nurses who don't know how to intubate a patient, you need to start learning. Take the opportunity to learn healthy patients because vets aren't always immediately available. And if you can work with another nurse or a PCA in the meantime to get the patient intubated and onto oxygen, we well, could say it, save a life. You may also want to store a selection of tracheostomy tubes with an emergency tracheotomy surgical kit in here too. But if you don't have the space, if your box isn't that big, then just place them together in, an, in a convenient place. And everyone in your practice should be familiar with the contents of the airway box and where essential equipment is kept. So now we've had a look at the equipment, let's move on to thinking about induction. So this is thinking not, not so much of the emergency, but the elective planned patient that you have in front of you. In addition to the equipment we've talked about, you also want to have a suction machine set up and available plugged in and ready to use. If you don't need it, it can go away again, no big deal. But if you do need it, you can waste valuable time going and getting it and plugging it in, finding all the bits. Pre-oxygenation for at least three to five minutes before starting to administer the induction agent can delay the onset of hypoxemia by three to four minutes. Maybe consider the use of a timer because we're always rushing and sometimes, you know, we want to push on and, and get the procedure done. But don't allow your vet to start in, in, inducing until the patient has had its oxygen. During a difficult intubation, this extra oxygen really can buy you valuable time. Use a tight, using a tight fitting mask, face, face mask, is shown to be more efficient at increasing the fraction of inspired oxygen than by flow by, but many patients find this stressful and they'll struggle against it. This increased stress uses up the extra oxygen, so the benefit is outweighed and should not be persisted with. The main thing at induction is to keep the patient calm and if flow by does not stress them out, then this is perfectly adequate. As we've said, have a good selection of endotracheal tubes and a laryngoscope available. Brachycephalic breeds require much smaller diameter tubes than other breeds of similar weight and size. So have a good selection, not just two or three sizes. I have like five or six sizes. You can never have enough ET tubes. So confirmation then of tracheal intubation is done by attaching a capnograph and giving a breath of oxygen. You should see an end tidal carbon dioxide trace because there's no carbon dioxide in the esophagus. Um, hair should not be placed at the end of the ET tube as it could be inhaled and pressing on the thorax should not be carried out either as in a trauma case this could be detrimental and it's bad practice to carry out. So get into the habit of using your capnograph at induction for confirmation of tracheal intubation. Keep the patient's head elevated until the cuff has been inflated. So if there is regurgitation, the patient's airway is protected. Keep the patient in sternal recumbency throughout the GA and this is to prevent atelectasis, which is collapse of the lungs, and maximise the use of both lungs for gas exchange and oxygenation. Watch their eyes. These patients with their squashed heads often end up with protruded eyes as well, 
and they're at risk at induction. If you're used to using white open weave bandage to hold the top jaw, then with a flat face, where we said we don't often have a longer maxilla or top jaw to work with, when we hang the white open weave, then that is often directly rubbing on the ocular surface, which can cause ocular and cranial ulceration. It could also increase the intraocular pressure. So if your patient had a corneal laceration and it's quite fragile at that point, then that would be catastrophic for the eye if that ruptured. Instead of using white open weave, I just use my fingers to hold the top jaw. So don't put your fingers in the mouth, but between the gum and the lip, as in this photo. This also holds the top lip out of the surgeon's view whenever they're carrying out the airway examination. Once the patient is safely intubated and the tube secured and attached to the breathing system, one of the first things that we do is lub lubricate both eyes and continue to do this every 30 minutes under the anaesthetic and then every four hours in the post-operative period. As with any general anaesthetic, you need to monitor vital signs continuously. These brachycephalic patients are usually further compromised, carrying some level of respiratory disease. And monitoring should be supplemented using a multi-parameter monitor. Heart rate, respiration rate, oxygen saturation, blood pressure, temperature, and tidal carbon dioxide levels should be monitored as a minimum. If your oscillometric monitor struggles to read on small patients, then use Doppler blood pressure monitoring. These patients often have higher than normal end tidal carbon dioxide with rapid shallow respiration rates and their lung compliance can be very low. <clears throat> they often need positive pressure ventilation support under anesthesia. Great care needs to be taken when moving the patient around not to dislodge the ET tube. It is important not to put pressure on the abdomen, which could cause regurgitation of stomach contents. The head should be kept elevated and the mouth checked frequently for signs of regurgitation so it can be suctioned out immediately if it's seen. For BOAS surgery, they are positioned in this photo on the left. So their top jaws is secured from like a frame like this or from two drip stands. And the surgeon is gonna to need to sit um, at the head directly face to face with the dog. So you need to consider the position of your anesthetic equipment and how the breathing system is gonna to attach to the patient. And you as the nurse or anesthetist need to have access to the patient also. We would use 90 degree elbow connectors. They're very useful um, in taking the circuit tubing away or the view of the surgeon's um, operating field. And just make sure everything gets taped securely to a pole um, so it's not gonna get dislodged or fall off during the procedure. Um, it's a good idea to put swabs like this in the back of the throat to catch surgical blood and prevent it trickling down the trachea. If they are used, then they must be accounted for before recovery. They should have ties attached to them, which could be tied to the ET tube. And a visual sticker stuck to the head of the patient as a reminder to remove them before recovery. Again, care needs to be taken that there is um, no pressure put on the ocular surface. So make sure that the whatever tapes or bandages are used, the drapes, all of those sort of things, that there's nothing in direct contact with the ocular surface. And remember to reapply that lube. <clears throat> so for patient um, <coughs> preparation, there is usually no clipping involved. And the mucosal surfaces of the mouth are just wiped over with a preparation of povidine iodine, 
in a 1 in 50 dilution. Make sure you wear gloves when you're using this stuff because it's good at staining your hands. And we would just place a swab in the solution, squeeze out the excess liquid and then just wipe the surfaces of the mouth. If you can't reach very far in with your fingers, then attach the swab to a forcep or something to help you. <clears throat> okay, so thinking now about recovery, some considerations. <coughs> so where is the recovery going to take place? This should be in a calm, quiet environment with one-to-one -one or one-to-two observation. Because if there is a problem, then at least two people will be needed to deal with it. There should be an oxygen source available, if needed, and suction equipment. It's a good idea anyway to suction down the ET tube before you recover the patient <coughs> to remove any blood and mucus that might have accumulated during the surgery. I usually prefer to recover these patients in theatre, but if the theatre is needed for another procedure, then a separate station should be set up for recovery with everything that you need. Next, consider are the patient's analgesia levels adequate before you turn off the ISO? When was the pre-med given? How long do those drugs last? Methadone starts to wear off after three hours if you're unsure what to give an additional dose, at least have the next dose drawn up and ready to give on recovery if it's required. We really don't want these patients to be waking up in pain, to panic, to increase their stress levels, increase respiration rate, and then have an airway crisis. Consider having a sedation plan ready before the patient is recovered also because it's imperative that these patients remain calm and not get stressed in hospital. How well did the pre-med work? Can this be repeated? Have a plan A and a plan B discussed with your surgeon so that takes saves time and stress later. Make sure you place a harness on the patient before recovery so that you can restrain them gently without scruffing or applying pressure around their neck. Consider emptying their bladder before recovery. So this is not a reason for stress in the immediate post-operative period. What is the patient's temperature? If they're too cold, then they'll wake up and their oxygen demand when shivering will be increased by 400%. And this is not acceptable and life-threatening in a brachycephalic patient. If they're too hot, the patient will wake up panting and uncomfortable. And this is also not good and life-threatening in the brachycephalic patient. So try to keep their temperature in the 37 point something degrees Celsius range. Just slightly lower than normal. Make sure the patient is in sternal recumbency before turning off the inhalation agent for two reasons. This will allow the lungs to fully inflate before coming off 100% oxygen and avoids disorientation for the patient waking up in an abnormal position. <clears throat> it's important to talk to them in a calm voice as well so they're reassured and not frightened as they come round. <laughs> Extubation, as we've said, the patient should be recovered next to an oxygen source so that once they're extubated, you can still give flow by oxygen. The ET tube should be left in place for as long as possible. Normally in dogs, we're looking to remove the ET tube once the hollow reflex is returned. But with brachycephalic patient, you need to wait must much longer. Often the patient is fully awake with the tube still in place and looking at you and quite happy to have the ET tube in place. So you must wait until the patient really makes an effort to spit their own tube out and then you can remove it. Don't try to overstimulate them to recover. 
We want them to wake up of their own accord. If you overstimulate them to extubate, then they go back to bed and go back to sleep again. And that's not desirable, as they could occlude if they've woken up too early. Once the tube is removed, a clean tube, half a size smaller, laryngoscope and induction agent should be available in case you need to re-intubate. A part used roll of bandage can be wedged into the mouth at this stage to help airflow and something to keep the head elevated. Try to monitor oxygen saturation on room air. This might not be possible if the patient is moving around so just provide flow by oxygen if possible. Listen to the inspiration respiratory sound. Look at the effort of the chest. Does it sound obstructed? Is the patient really sucking in air into their lungs or is it flowing easily? A patient who's had airway surgery should be immediately better but with post-operative swelling, this could deteriorate in the 12 hours post-surgery. This is why we want to keep them in hospital to observe for this, and they're checked frequently throughout the night by qualified nurses able to recognise them getting into difficulty and intervening. If the patient is calm, or is the patient calm or distressed? All of these are subjective assessments. They can give you information about if you need to call the veterinary surgeon back to intervene with the patient or let it recover itself. After the anaesthetic, once the patient is stable and the dog is lifting their head and on their feet, this is the time the patient can return to a kennel and one-to-one -one monitoring can be stepped down. Monitoring should still carry on, but maybe from a distance. Keeping an eye on the respiration rate, the respiration effort, listening to the noise that they're making and checking their mucous membrane color. Remember the airway box or induction tray should follow the patient and a patent IV catheter should be maintained. If you've got quite an active patient who's getting tangled in the IV line, this might mean stopping the fluid therapy in order to preserve the IV catheter and just flush it instead every four hours with saline. We use nebulized adrenaline for 10 minutes every hour in the post-GA period. And this can open up the airways by reducing inflammation by causing vasoconstriction vessels. It can also help to reduce any post-operative hemorrhage that might be occurring. And the dose is on the screen. Um, so smaller patients have one mil of adrenaline with four mils of saline, 10 to 20 kilos, two mils to three mils of saline, and over 20 kilos, three mils of adrenaline and two mils of saline. And that file is popped into the chamber of the nebulizer and usually lasts for the, the 10 minute period. I'm also a big fan of the use of Otravine nasal drops. These can be applied one drop to each nares before recovery of GA. And it's a nasal decongestant and works well to reduce secretions for up to 10 hours. Feeding of the patient after general anaesthesia should be left for two to three hours to ensure the sedation effects of the anaesthetic have subsided. The initial feeding should be supervised and controlled. So that means hand feeding small balls of food one at a time and ensuring each ball has been completely swallowed before feeding the next. If the patient has had BOAS correction surgery, then the veterinary surgeon may not want any food to be given until the following morning because of the risk of aspiration pneumonia. If the patient vomits overnight and there is swelling following surgery, then this could be catastrophic for the patient. However, some studies have shown that there is an increased incidence of reflux and vomiting 
with prolonged fasting compared to shorter fasting. So there's a mixed opinion on this and will essentially come down to your veterinary surgeon's personal experience and preference of managing these cases. Sometimes the patient is just too stressed or overstimulated and excited by the kennel environment. You can use sedation, move them to a quieter room for observation, or you might decide with your veterinary surgeon to send them home. The veterinary surgeon would need to weigh up the pros and cons of this and discuss it with the owner. If they live relatively close to the practice, they could go home with an IV catheter still in place for the night and come back next morning for IV removal if all is well. This has to be balanced with the risk of the patient getting into difficulty at home, not through stress, but because of post-operative swelling. And that might go unnoticed, or the owner might not make it back to the practice in time and witness a distressful death from airway obstruction. When things don't turn out well for our brachycephalic patients, the next intervention might be to place a tracheostomy tube. These require a high level of intensive nursing in. Consideration should be taken by your veterinary surgeon whether it is appropriate to treat these patients if you do not have 24-hour one-to-one care available to you. If the patient is not stable to transfer to a 24-hour facility first, then it should be transferred as soon as it has recovered from the tracheostomy tube anaesthetic to a referral facility able to provide one-to-one -one intensive care. <coughs> So these two terms, tracheotomy and tracheostomy, they're quite similar and easily confused. I, I get confused by them all the time. A tracheotomy refers to the surgical technique where a temporary opening is made into the trachea through a ventral midline approach. Tracheostomy refers to the tube which sits in the tracheotomy hole and provides a permanent opening whilst it's in place. Tracheotomy surgery is either going to happen in an emergency where an ET, in an ET tube intubation is not able to be achieved or under more controlled conditions where the patient can be intubated but when it's extubated the airway is too obstructed and needs a new opening to bypass the obstruction. This might be post-operative swelling that needs a few days to subside after BOAS corrective surgery. Whilst assembling the necessary equipment, someone should be oxygenating the patient. Once intubated, everyone can relax and the patient can be prepared for surgery normally. The patient will be in dorsal recumbency with the head and neck extended over a sandbag. Clip and prepare the ventral neck as you would for any surgery. With the patient intubated, once it comes to inserting the tracheostomy tube, you will need to stop the inhalation agent and extubate the patient so the surgeon can insert the tracheostomy tube. You can then continue the general anaesthesia via the tracheostomy tube whilst the wound is closed up. Or you might decide to carry out the entire procedure, procedure <coughs> using total intravenous anaesthesia, which would mean less exposure to staff from inhalation agents and is entirely appropriate in this situation. So you would just provide oxygen through the tube and then use a, a continuous rate infusion of propyl, which uh, the dose is 0.5 to 2 mg per kg per hour, or alfaxalone, which is 6 to 9 mg per kg per hour. And really a syringe driver must be used for accurate dosing during this. If the patient has not been successfully intubated, then things become more urgent. It is important to stay calm and follow the direction from the person in charge. As nurses, knowing what our vet is going to ask for before they know themselves will make things more efficient 
having the equipment together in one place, discussing plans of action with the team ahead of time so everyone is on the same page will also help. So two possible techniques that can buy you time if the patient is unable to be intubated are one to intubate with a rigid urinary catheter or two insert a large bore IV catheter into the trachea. Both of these can then be attached to a 5 mil syringe with an 11 millimeter ET tube connector which will then attach to the circuit for oxygen delivery into the lungs. In the emergency situation, there won't be time for an IM pre-med. If you have IV access, you can consider giving a quick acting opioid such as fentanyl IV, and then administer a dose of longer acting methadone for recovery analgesia. If you're unable to intubate, you'll need to keep the patient anaesthetized using a TIVA of propofol or alfaxalone and provide oxygen through your urinary catheter or IV catheter that's in the trachea. Towards the end of the procedure, you'll want to think about a sedation plan as there's no sedation on board apart from the effects of opioid and induction agent. And again, we don't want this patient waking up in a panic. Recovery from a tracheostomy tube placement is the same as with a BOAS patient. However, the one-to-one -one monitoring does not stop with these patients. Patients with tracheostomy tubes require one-to-one -one constant supervision. At any moment, the tube could block with mucus or become dislodged and the airway become occluded and the patient suffocate and die. <clears throat> You need to have to hand the equipment required for keeping the tube clear from secretions. Gloves, sterile swabs, sterile saline, sterile cotton buds, flexible suction catheter that's small enough to fit inside the tracheostomy tube. Spare tracheostomy tubes to swap in and clean. A nebulizer and hydro HME or thermavent. This could be in an ICU or if you don't have an ICU then set up an area in your prep room dedicated to the care of this one patient. Whenever we breathe normally through our nose the air passes through a series of turbinates in our nose that warms it up and humidifies it. If we bypass this, as in the case of a tracheostomy tube, then we need to humidify the air in some other way, or the dry air irritates the lungs and lining of the trachea, causing excess secretions to be produced. There are a number of things we can do to humidify the airway. So, one is injecting one to five mils of saline into the tracheostomy tube every one to two hours. We can humidify the air using nebulized saline directed at the tracheostomy tube entrance for 10 minutes every one to two hours. And three, we could use a hydro tracheostomy attachment on the end of the tracheostomy tube, which will humidify the air these are also handy as they are in a T shape, so the patient can lie down without blocking the entrance of the tube. If you don't have access to one of these, then you'll need to provide the patient with something to rest their head on. So when they sleep or rest, they can do so without blocking their trach tube, as the patient in this photo on the right has learned to do. In this case, um, we just used a heat moisture exchanger or thermavent to humidify the air and it was changed every six hours. Suctioning is an important part of caring for the tracheostomy tube. Suctioning is carried out at various intervals to keep the tube clear from secretions. And the procedure for doing this is as follows. So firstly, we want to pre-oxygenate the patient for five minutes, first of all. 
Then we insert a sterile suction catheter into the tracheostomy tube. Next, we apply suction using a 20 ml syringe or more effectively using a suction machine. But we need to make sure that the machine is set to its lowest suction power. And make sure that you're only suctioning inside the tracheostomy tube lumen. So maybe pre-mark the length on the suction tube. And don't advance the catheter into the trachea as that will cause irritation and damage to the trachea lining. We want to suction for 10 seconds, but be mindful that you are obstructing the patient's airway at this point and stop before this if there are any signs of dyspnea. Afterwards, we want to oxygenate the patient again for five minutes. You can keep the end of the catheter inside its sterile packaging when it's not in use and then you can reuse it. But really a new catheter, new sterile catheter should be used every day. Cleaning of the tracheostomy tube can be a bit intensive. There are two different types of tracheostomy tube, some with stylets and some without. So depending on the type that you're using will depend on what you do here. Tubes with stylets are cleaned by removing the stylet and placing a temporary stylet whilst you clean the first stylet. When removing the stylet, you remove it in a slow twist action with the idea <clears throat> that you drag as much mucus with you rather than a sudden movement dislodging the mucus leaving it in the trachea or the tube. And then these tubes should be changed completely every 24 hours. Single lumen tubes are more commonly used in small animals. They have no stylet and are kept clear using the saline that we've talked about injecting for humidity and suctioning using the flexible suction tube. <clears throat> The entire tube should be changed twice a day. The tube should then be cleaned using an enzymatic cleaner and disinfectant for the required contact times, rinsed and dried, ready for the next tube change. Changing the tube. So if this is a planned change, then pre-oxygenate the patient again for five minutes first. Sometimes though the tube blocks suddenly if the patient moves or coughs a mucus plug into the tube or sometimes the tube just comes dislodged and there isn't time to pre-oxygenate the patient. Especially with in patients that have lots of rolls of skin around their neck, it can be quite challenging to keep the tube in position. As primary carers for these patients, we need to be comfortable knowing how to recognise these complications and replace the dislodged tube or change it yourself without waiting for the vet to come out of consult or wherever they're hiding. <clears throat> this is a two person job. So if you're caring for the patient by yourself, then you need to be able to con call for he help if you need urgently. So we would always use the walkie talkie for immediate communication such as that. To change the tube, usually one person gently restrains the patient and tilts the head back whilst holding the top suture, which will have been labelled up. The second person gently pulls the lower suture labelled down and the entry to the trachea opens up, allowing the second person to insert the clean tube. The tube is secured using nylon umbilical tape tied around the neck. So when handling the tube or working around the stoma, remember this is a surgical wound. So wash your hands and wear clean gloves. The skin around the stoma can be cleaned using gauze swabs and sterile saline or very dilute 0.05% chlorhexidine. Solutions should just be used on the skin 
and not allowed to enter the incision. Start at the wound edge and move outwards. Sterile cotton buds may also help to clean under the wings of the tube. A dry gauze swab can then be used to dry the skin and absorb the exudates. Materials with loose fibres should not be used in case they break off and get inhaled by the patient. At this time, the wound should be assessed for signs of inflammation, swelling, irritation or infection. Petroleum jelly can be used on the skin if there is rubbing and sore irritation, but again should not enter the incision wound. And the ties securing the tube should also be changed whenever they get soiled. This patient with its open wound will produce large amounts of discharge and can harbour bacteria. The patient is going to shed fur and so it's important to implement changing bedding more frequently than normal with these patients and also to disinfect the environment. We want to prevent loose hair and fibres from bedding being inhaled into the tube. So we want to use older, well-washed bedding rather than fluffy new bedding. The patient should only have a harness on, no neck leads and should only go for short walks. I've also seen a, bas a small basket type muzzle being placed over the tracheostomy tube in an upside down position and fastened around the neck, which works well to protect the tube from external obstruction. And this photo is not one of mine, it's um, from the vet nurse journal. These interventions we've talked about are required more frequently in the first 24 to 48 hours and then they can be spaced out as, subscri as the secretions subside. But the important thing to note is to use your common sense. If the patient is struggling and needs intervention with the tube by suctioning or nebulizing more frequently than has been prescribed on the hospital sheet, then you need to do it. When to take the tube out is a decision made with the veterinary surgeon in charge of the case. If the tube doesn't fill the lumen of the trachea, then the tube can be occluded to see how the patient copes. But if the tube is taking up most of the lumen of the trachea, then obviously there won't be enough space for the patient to breathe around the tube. So you need to remove the tube and apply a sterile dressing over the tracheotomy site and the patient will needs to be observed to see how it copes breathing through its nose. If it's okay, then this is left out and one-to-one -one observation is continued for the next 12 hours to ensure no difficulty arises. If the patient does not cope, then the tube needs to be replaced and the patient oxygenated for five minutes. Tube removal should not be attempted again for a further 24 hours. Once the patient has coped with the tube out for 12 hours, then the stay sutures can be cut and removed. The incision is usually left to heal by second intention, and this minimises the occurrence of subcutaneous emphysema. So as you can see, there is quite a lot to do with these patients and a lot of equipment needed. The kennel environment is not really suitable. They need to be in an ICU unit with qualified experienced staff caring for them on a one-to-one -one basis. These cases definitely keep you on your toes and once a tracheostomy tube is in place, then it involves a lot of manpower to maintain but they are very rewarding when they leave and have a better quality of life. So this brings us to the end of the talk this evening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the journey of the BOAS patient and I hope there's some useful tips that you can take away and, and use in your own practice. Um, my email address is on the screen and the details of Northern Ireland veterinary specialists. If you need to contact one of our specialists in surgery or cardiology, then you're more than welcome to ring or email us.
Um, so we'll just have a look and see if we've got any questions, if I can remember how to do this. Okay, so um, the dose of ACP that I talked about was um, 0 0.005 mix per kg to give intravenously. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, and the cough inflator, they can be got from ACE Veterinary Supplies, I believe. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's that's all our questions that I can see. And I think that's all from me. Um, thank you again for listening and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>